2015, I see you. Thanks for taking some time to get on point with me tonight. I'm Tommy Laren. Now, you know I'm all about forward movement, but we can't forget to look back. Sometimes you see it clearer from the rear view mirror than you ever did looking out over the hood. It's been five months almost to the day that we've been getting you on point with the issues that matter most. 110 of them, in fact. From Obamacare to Uber and everything in between. The protests, the riots, national security, ISIS, Ebola, the environment, oh my. Yeah, we even covered SeaWorld. Now, what other political talk show would talk about Shamu? That's right, we went there. Now, with your feedback, I was able to narrow down those 110 topics into five main points. You ready? Energy, the Middle East, privacy and cybersecurity, immigration, and military might. See, these are the topics you might discuss around the family table. And if you don't, you really should start. Now let's kick off the conversation with what's fueling America. Life takes energy, folks. So how low can it go? Nationally, the average price for a gallon of regular gas fell every day since September 25th. Today's average, $2.30. So the mainstream media has been rather quiet about exactly why our gas prices are falling. Hmm, could it be they don't want to admit it has a lot to do with that dirty little word, fracking? Vast reserves of oil and natural gas that were previously inaccessible are now unlocked. Now, some will tell you that domestic production doesn't make our gas prices drop. So, okay, there are other factors, sure, but it's simple economics. When oil supply outpaces demand, prices drop. So what is fracking? I chatted with geoscientist Terry Engelder from the documentary Frack Nation a few months back. Take a look and get on point. A lot of people don't even know, and they get all riled up about it, but they don't even know what it is. So how do you frack? Fracking is a process that involves splitting rock that is very impermeable. What that means is that this rock, it's called a gas shale, it's a very black rock, holds gas very tightly and that gas doesn't flow out uh, easily or naturally. And so what happens is that companies will drill down into this shale and uh, from this well that they've created, they will pump in water under relatively high pressure. That water literally causes the rock to split apart and it's those cracks driven out into the rock that allow this gas very tightly held then to flow up a well bore and be produced. Okay, so you mentioned the process behind it. Now I know a lot of the misconception is that this hydraulic fluid that they use to extract this is so toxic and so horrible. Can you shed some light on this? Is it really so bad? The fluid that is used has additives. The additives are many uh, of the types of common products that we would expect from a household, including dish, uh, dish soap, um, disinfectants of one sort or another. I, I, this is the type of material that is underneath the kitchen sink. And of course, it's understood that you would not drink that uh, undiluted. And in fact, the, uh, the companies that use these types of materials dilute them greatly to the point where uh, they are not nearly as, as toxic as they would be in their concentrated form. I think one of the other things to keep in mind in all of this is that these fluids are pumped down into the ground in a gas shale. Only about 20% of the fluid comes back. The other 80% of the fluid is sequestered permanently in these, these gas shales. In other words, it stays in place and will never leak out. This is one of the misconceptions concerning a gas shales. Just this week, I published a paper in the Journal of Unconventional Oil and Gas Resources that describes this process of sequestration. The technical term is imbibition, and uh, imbibition can be uh, pictured as nothing more than the action of a sponge soaking up this water. And uh, of so, course, a sponge can hold a great deal of water. Terry, this doesn't seem so scary. So how come the anti-frackers have had such a loud voice? I think partly is because they see the documentary Gasland and they see that faucet water going up in flames. I know that this was addressed in Frack Nation, but can you tell our viewers that this is a bunch of baloney with this, this water lighting on fire supposedly because of fracking? Well, I'd rather answer the question in another way. I, I've just published another paper recently that describes the six early mistakes that industry made. And it's very important to appreciate that, that this is a very complex industry. There are risks. Industry, however, when they learn of these mistakes, act to correct them. 
For example, one of the early mistakes was not to sample a groundwater, a drinking water wells ahead of time and explain the types of uh, natural chemistry that's found in, in that type of water. Now, what happened, of course, was that uh, a number of people, either environmental activists or people who wished to profit from these mistakes, then went out and further um, exacerbated public fear to the point where people like Josh Fox then were able to make movies that, that are um, packed with misinformation. And sensationalism. And, and, and that's another thing I want to address as well. So if we're speaking specifically to Demick, Pennsylvania, they the EPA showed that their drinking water was fine. So how come the debate didn't end there? The EPA itself said your water's fine. Well, in fact, uh, something else just happened. I've, I've submitted a third paper that we're going to describe that has gone back and analyzed the famous water well explosion endemic that set all of this off in the first place. And a very careful analysis shows that the event, whatever it was, did not release enough energy to mimic a gas uh, explosion in this particular vault. Now, it's not clear exactly what happened. Seamus McGraw, for example, in his book, End of Country, offers a theory. But one thing is certain, the violence that one expects from this type of an explosion, the heat that one expects from this type of explosion do not manifest themselves. And yet the media ran off with this particular event, called it a, a gas well explosion, blamed it on, on in, industry. And the evidence since that particular event suggests that something else may have happened. Now, here is why this is so important to understand. Science is science. The extreme environmentalists are clouding the debate. Along with their buddies in Hollywood, they are repeating the same narrative. Well, it's a false narrative, and I take issue with that. There are legitimate concerns with fracking. We have to pace ourselves and do it safely. But stop demonizing oil companies for flaming tap water and other overblown claims and outright lies. That leads me to my next clip, Keystone. This 1,200-mile pipeline between Canada and Nebraska would bring up roughly 35 million gallons of oil per day. Again, the fringe environmentalists are pushing their agenda, and they're in the ears of folks like President Obama. Now, from mining to the car, a barrel of oil sands crude creates 17% more greenhouse gas emissions than average oil. But there's a twist. Even the State Department said that that oil will get burned regardless. So the question is, where do you want to get your oil from, Canada or Venezuela? Now, the new Republican-dominated Congress has vowed to put this pipeline at the top of the agenda. We all have a stake in this, baby. I spoke with senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, Mark Mills, about Keystone, and here is what you need to know. Is building the pipeline in the national interest, and if so, will Obama see it that way? Of course it is. And not only is it our national interest, Canada is the United States' biggest trading partner. I'm biased here. I'm Canadian, but it's our biggest trading partner. And North America is a very friendly place to produce oil for the rest of the world. One point, just a quick observation about the Keystone Pipeline that's important. The heavy oil that it will carry from Canada will replace heavy oil that those refineries in the Gulf Coast currently buy from Venezuela. So it's a direct swap from buying exactly the same kind of oil from a friend taking it away from a not-so-friendly country. So what's the delay on this? Uh, as I said before, two-thirds of the American public is in favor. It seems like it's gaining bipartisan support, though it did fail in the Senate. Uh, that could change, obviously. So what's the holdup? It seems like everyone's all for Keystone. Well, this has become a, a classic, and no pun intended, considering it's the oil sands, a line in the sand issue for extreme environmentalists who wanted to block it as a symbol of uh, their opposition to oil and hydrocarbons. And many of the honest ones will tell you, will say that it in fact is a symbol. Obviously, the oil will go somewhere else. It'll go to China. It will get exported by rail or pipes to the west or east coast of Canada. So it's not going to stay locked up in the ground. It is simply a political symbol to the detriment of the best trading partner and great ally of the United States over, really, all of the uh, history of this country. And as you mentioned, it's going to get there anyway. It's going to be burned anyway. Even the State Department said that. So mm -hmm. what gives in this situation with the environmentalists? Do they really have a stake in this? It's going to get burned either way. So why not let it go through our backyard? Well, it's, it's, uh, you're asking me. I'm a physicist, not a 
a psychiatrist. So you're asking me to figure out read their minds or why they drew a line in the sand on this one. I can uh, I can understand tactically why they picked a project that was dramatic and easy to explain as a line in the sand to oppose, to get Obama administration to not support it on the basis of their worries about uh, climate change, about burning hydrocarbons. The real problem is obvious one is it has no practical effect at all. If, if you are serious about reducing the use of hydrocarbons, you don't do it that way. Uh, it will make no difference. And in fact, if the oil sands were never used, it wouldn't make any difference because so much more oil is being produced elsewhere in the world, outside of the United States and elsewhere in the United States, frankly. And if they don't use the pipelines, as you mentioned before, they're going to use the rail shipments to do so. And isn't that actually more dangerous, uh, more likely to cause accidents and environmental damage that way? Well, pipelines are certainly the safest way to transport uh, oil. There's no question about it. Turns out the rails are pretty darn safe too. When you look at the the quantity of oil moving on rail uh, on rail and the very very rare accidents, statistically extremely safe. However, it, it's more dangerous, so it'd be nicer not to do that. Uh, it's in fact it has other advantages. The rail system gives you a lot of flexibility on where you gather and, and take it, where it would be refined. So some uh, some markets would actually prefer the, the rail. But for this particular kind of oil, it's not a question of safety, really. I mean, the difference is, is really de minimis. It's not a big deal. The real issue is that it's just economics and a practical issue. It's the best way to get that oil to the Gulf Coast to replace the Venezuelan oil. Venezuela has not been our friend for a long time. It would not make a scintilla difference because it's exactly the same kind of oil. The environmental community has uh, mounted an extremely effective political campaign. They have certainly frightened a lot of uh, politicians, and mostly Democrats, worried about voting for it, making it look like they're uh, not friends of the environment. It really is a hollow argument. It's a disingenuous argument, frankly. And Mark, this reminds me a lot of the fracking debate as well. A lot of the same scare tactics are used. And before we move into the economic impacts, which to me are the most important, I do want to mention that pledge from TransCanada. They pledged that this would be the safest pipeline ever constructed in the United States. They're going to have more shutoff valves, things of that sure. nature. So they've really pledged to make this safe. Obviously, nobody wants an oil spill. Republicans, Democrats, Obama, nobody. But if they're making that pledge, as long as we hold them to it, I see the environmental, environmental impacts as being being way overblown. Next thing I want to turn to, though, is what we all care about, and that's jobs, the economy, mm -hmm. gas prices. So let's start with jobs first. Now, they mm -hmm. say that they estimate it's going to be about 42,000 jobs, and now their argument is that those are going to be temporary. What do you say to that? To me, I say 42,000 jobs <laughs> for two years is 42,000 jobs more than we would have without it. Well, it's a bit of an irony here. That's an infrastructure system. Pipelines are infrastructure. And this president has been promoting uh, bills to have infrastructure jobs created, which are all temporary. All highway jobs are temporary. All bridge jobs are temporary. Every infrastructure job is temporary. And that's the nature of building infrastructure. You build it, you're finished. It's a temporary job. It's a high paying job. And if you do lots of temporary jobs in a row, you have a nice, nicely employed economy. Coming up next, Mo Diab, Philippe Azaline, and the great debate. If you missed it before, here is your second chance, so you better keep it on point. Welcome back. Now, if you've been watching On Point from the start, you know that the Middle East, specifically the conflict in Gaza, has been a reoccurring theme. The U.S. State Department described Israeli actions as unacceptable 87 times in 2014, with only three countries being more unacceptable. According to a recent foreign policy article, that is. Yeah, Israel was sandwiched between North Korea and Pakistan. Most of the finger-wagging involved the Israeli settlements and plans to construct additional housing behind the Green Line. Civilian casualties during Operation Protective Edge were also mentioned quite a bit. Now, I personally hit on this issue so often for several reasons. For one, last summer was bloody. The rockets, the raids, the airstrikes, and the propaganda from both sides made the conflict between Israel and Palestine one to watch closely. But if you remember, I decided to do something a little different. I brought both sides of the argument to the table to hash it out. We called it the Great Debate. Philippe Azeline on one side, Mo Diab on the other, me in the middle. It was heated, but at the end of the day, it was a conversation that needed to happen. I'm glad it happened on my show. Once again, the Great Debate. Enjoy. 
to refocus on the great debate, the one debate that's raged on for centuries. Here on On Point, I'm taking a different approach to the issue. We've covered the bloodshed, we've covered the history in the region time and time again. Tonight, we're focused on working together in this sole effort to find common ground and maintain some level of peace. And with that being said, I'd like to welcome my guest, Israel advocacy strategist Philippe Azaline and human rights activist Mo Diab. So thank you, gentlemen, so much for being here. And right now, I want to start talking um, first and foremost about the new settlement. And I want to toss it to you, Philippe, first. So now this new settlement is a, a thousand acres and it's the biggest land appropriation in 30 years. So what is the motivation for Israel continuing to settle the region? So um, I think it's important to have the pr proper terminology. It's not a new settlement. It's an area of vacant land that the state declared was state land. Uh, I can only guess at the reasons. The reason is probably to offset or do a counterweight to the unilateral steps that Abbas has been doing that also don't fit into the framework of peace. Abbas has been going to the UN and taking unilateral steps, the president of the Palestinian Authority, taking unilateral steps to further his cause. So Israel is trying to, I think, counterweight. But these are areas that were expected to stay within Israel in any case. But I think there's an important point here. The entire settlement issue, which is these Jewish civilian population centers in the West Bank, can be resolved overnight if the Palestinian Authority offers these people citizenship. There's 1.6 million Arabs who are Israeli citizens. The only Arabs in the entire Middle East who have democratic rights. I don't see why the Palestinian Authority couldn't say to these settlers, these areas are now under the state of Palestine, the new state of Palestine. You're welcome to stay, just like those Arabs in Israel. And if you don't like it, you can leave. Israel is ethnic nationalism, an ethnic national state. We don't identify, we don't discriminate based on any kind of ethnicity, religion, race, creed just based it on an association of common principles and beliefs that bind us together, that's where we have the United States. Israel discriminates, and this is their state is literally two months ago in the Israeli Supreme Court, they ruled there is no such thing as an Israeli national. This is because they're an ethnic national state. They have four different classes of citizens, which means that the rights and equality, there is no constitution in Israel, there's basic law. There is no clause about equality and justice. There clearly is not. This, this is, is absolute lies. You have no right to lie you're, to people You're disagreeing like with the Israeli I, Supreme I worked Court the, I worked ruling at the Israeli of June Supreme of 2014. Court. Okay, I worked at the Israeli Supreme Court for Chief if, if Justice If you disagree with me, Runes. the viewers can look it up. It is not a matter of opinion. The viewers can look up legal documents. This is, gonna, this is a widely legal. I insist the, on responding to this. No, but this, he's talking about my family. He's talking about people I, I've worked we, with. He's talking about a judge I was with personal, personal. though. No, this, when, you, when you falsely accuse... Which judge did you work for personally? Grunis. When you falsely accuse a nation of being racist, of having four different... I don't think that's what he did. That's I said, actually said, he said this four tiers of, of citizenship, and it is and it is uh, defined by ethno nationalism. Now that is absolutely false. By definition, from like the to Israeli respond. government, they're like an ethnic respond. national state, which I is why the Israeli, Israeli citizen, citizen, okay, and we're I keep it very court, separated, though, gentlemen. Are you an Israeli ready? national? Yes. We have there is no such thing separate. as an Israeli national. That is absolutely not true. Supreme that is Court absolutely not true. I'd like to respond. I think your viewers have the right You're to know facts and not be manipulated emotionally by the these viewers triggers have the right. of racism okay. and all these we're not, other words. We're going to keep racism. We're going to keep all those things out of it because we're not going to do the said. name calling. But it's we're not going to do I the name call, calling. But the name, so, I was called a name. I was called as an Israeli part of a country that this is absolutely false, supposedly is different than America and discriminates against people. And I think it's important for your viewers to have the actual facts. They can make their opinion against Israel if they want, but they should do so. On the facts, I, I think you have it's a duty more here to and he is coming here and spouting absolutely for 66 egregious, years. manipulative okay. propaganda. This is what we're going to do. Manipulative we want, propaganda. We want to keep propaganda. propaganda. Okay. We're not going to discuss the we'll existence. And what year was gentlemen, it founded? Gentlemen, gentlemen, we're going to go to break. We're going to come back. We're going to move forward. We're going to talk about solutions because obviously we. I would we've like hit to address impasse. the issue of Israeli law. And the problem with the mainstream media is the world sees the Americans as the Obama administration and all the decisions that they make when. In reality, we have all of our freedoms here, and we're not afraid to speak out. In the United States, if we criticize Obama, it does not make us anti-Christ or anti-Christian. However, if we speak against the Israeli policies in the government, we're labeled immediately anti-Semitic. Or if we speak it, against Palestinians, we're, we're Islamophobic. We are, we are, we are both, scared both sides. to speak in... You're right, I agree, I agree. It, it, it I don't see what the, what the relevance, what, I don't see what the relevance of the this, relevance this monologue is. is. I want to talk about what I see. He, 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 he made a point. I'm not stereotyping, that's what I want to okay. address. All right, we're going to, we're going to, we have to, in, in the itself. interest of time, gentlemen, we Legally, have to. the 22 Arab countries are not democracies, Philippe. and they have rules Legally. against in the interest of time, Philippe, we have to. ethnic nation state, not really? like America. <laughs> no. We really have to be done at this point. Okay, we really have to be done now.
So after the great debate, I invited both Philippe and Mo back on separately to discuss unrest in the Middle East. This summer saw another tumor of unrest, ISIS. President Obama made a particular point of declaring that the Islamic State terrorists did not represent Islam. Now, most Americans find that hard to believe, but wait a second. There are extreme Muslims, but there are also extreme Christians, Mormons, and Jews. You may be surprised to know that most Muslims hate Islamic extremists more than you do. Now, as a Christian, but also as a patriot, it was important for me to have an educated discussion about Islam. Now, I invited Mo Dia back to the table to get us on point. Here it is. The most important thing to understand is that when you hear the terms such as Islamist or jihadist, they're actually used completely out of context when in uh, referencing jihadist, but the term Islamist is just a derogatory term. It's a device to take Islam, link it to something that represents radicals and extremist Muslims, and replacing it with something that sounds like Islam, just like Christianity to Christians, Islamist to Islam. It's this association. And when people make this association, they start thinking that all followers of Islam support this, when in reality, we should just be calling it Muslim extremist, because there are Christian extremists, there are Jewish extremists. Right, there are extremists in every religion. Of course, and these extremists represent a small, small percentage of people of that faith that don't follow that faith. In the, in the reference of ISIS. ISIS claims to follow Islam, claims to uh, follow Sharia law. However, they're killing Muslims, they're killing Christians. So if they were following the, um, the principles uh, and the pillars of Islam, they would not be behaving in this way. And what we're noticing too is that the mainstream propaganda, the mainstream media is using these terms Islamist and Jihadist again and again. Over and over again. And no one really knows what they mean. They use the terms and they associate them with these videos and the videos are of these extremists killing people and swearing death to the United States and the West. When in reality, who are they? They are a group of sociopaths. They are a group that listen to what their leaders say who are, and they're a group of people who are well paid. ISIS is receiving anywhere between $2,000 to $3,000 a month for their members. That's more than our um, United States service when, um, men and women. So it's not necessarily about religion for them or fighting for religion, it's the core of it is money. The core of it is money in my opinion. And I do believe that none of the principles of Islam are demonstrated in their actions. Their actions are actually sociopathic. Now, in the name of balance, I also invited Philippe Azaline back on the show to talk about propaganda. Now, the Israel-Palestine conflict was full of it. Pick a mainstream outlet, they ate it up. Let's look back at what Philippe had to say about trolling and fiery rhetoric. Take a look. The social media war is becoming, in my opinion, one of the central battlegrounds, as you said at the beginning. Um, it is very powerful in perpetuating the narrative which... To my chagrin, I think is much more solid on the extremes than in the center, uh, the, the mainstream that wants peace. The Palestinians have been, uh, I wouldn't even say the Palestinians, it's anti-Israel advocates have been using social media to push a narrative of absolute victimhood on the Palestinian side. Uh, they use emotional triggers that everybody has in their repertoire. So to some people, it's apartheid. To some people, it's genocide, whatever it is that triggers the right emotions, and they've been pushing through this false use of, of these words and accusations, a narrative that I think is an impediment to any progress and to any peace. Do we see that on both sides, Philippe? Because I'm very aware of Twitter right now, the hashtag Gaza under attack is still popular, even now, and people are still tweeting about it. But I see it on both sides. Is that something that you see as well? There's definitely an effort on both sides to win over public opinion by social media. I don't think by any stretch of the imagination, and I, I mean, I was working in this, and I'm studying it now, I don't think by any stretch of the imagination the Israelis or the pro-Israel side is anywhere near as organized or as focused or as relentless as the anti-Israel side that likes to call itself pro-Palestinian, but I don't think. Uh, groups like Students for Justice in Palestine, for example, are very popular in the U.S., and they've achieved a very big presence in social media, um, they are much more professional in pushing a narrative, which I have to say is often dishonest or, or uh, but half honest. Philippe, and the Israeli they... side is not as, uh, the Israeli, sorry, the Israeli side is not as professional, uh, not even close in doing that. Still ahead, we know the government is watching, but who else? A look back at privacy and cybersecurity is next. Keep it here.
Welcome back to On Point. Let's bring it back to another hot topic, the NSA and our privacy. Now, many of you probably didn't know that the night before Christmas Eve, the NSA dropped hundreds of pages worth of reports. Now, some of those reports detailed U.S. citizens that were inadvertently swept up in the government surveillance. Now, they say this happened due to unintentional technical or human error. But if you believe that one, I have some prime swampland to sell you. Thanks to Edward Snowden and German news outlet Spiegel, we're getting a new look at the agency's routine interception of web servers, and we now know that the NSA can decrypt virtual private networks. But the good news is that as of 2012, certain emails and chats were still indecipherable by the NSA database when encrypted with the right tools. A while back, I spoke with the deputy director of GAP National Security, Kathleen McClellan, about the failed USA Freedom Act and the future of privacy in America. Take a look at what she had to say. Whether or not we need the Patriot Act is, is an important question, um, because if you remember, it was passed in um, October of 2001 in response to the 9-11 attacks. Right. However, we learned later on that it wasn't actually a lack of authority that made the government misintelligence leading up to 9-11. It was mismanagement and a failure to identify and share intelligence that the government actually had. So is there a national security need for this type of metadata collection? I know the Obama administration has said in the past that it's crucial to national security efforts that they collect and store these things. Is there any merit to that argument? Um, and could they make that argument with the growth and expansion of ISIS and homegrown terrorism that we're seeing now? I mean, I think that the Obama administration could certainly make that argument, but it was um, it was Senator Mitch McConnell that we heard making that precise argument in the days leading up to the bill, and and I have no doubt that, that contributed uh, to killing the bill. The Obama administration actually supported the Freedom Act, but I think what's universally agreed here is that the bulk metadata collection program has not caught one single terrorist. No one is saying that. The White House's own hand-picked review group agrees that it hasn't caught terrorists. The Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board agrees. The authors of the Patriot Act agree that this program should end. Nobody seems to think that this program should continue. So the question is, why isn't Congress able to pass a bill ending it? And my question is, why, if it's not proving to be successful in catching terrorists, why do they want our records in the first place? I mean, maybe it's the conspiracy theorist in me, and I'll try not to think the worst, but to me, it just seems pretty blatant. I don't know why they would need to collect this information, especially for U.S. citizens, if it's not solving any problems. You know, I think that's a very good question. And... Uh... I don't think that a conspiracy theory is even necessary to have a problem with this kind of collection because it's not about what they're collecting. It's about uh, who they're collecting it on and why they're collecting it. And you don't need to be a conspiracy theorist to, to want to trust but verify the government. And I don't find myself using that quote very often, but this is an issue that's not partisan. And it's an issue that liberals and conservatives can agree on because privacy affects everybody. So we know our government is watching, but who else? From Sony to PlayStations and even the White House, 2014 was the year of hacking. In fact, I would go as far as to say that hacking is the new national security threat to keep our eyes on in 2015. Think about it. How often do you use the internet, a credit card, or heck, even open up your laptop? It seems like someone is always watching. So what can we do to protect the country and our personal cybersecurity? I spoke with CEO of BBS Systems and cybersecurity expert Scott Schober about this very issue. So watch and learn. One thing everybody forgets about is with social media, and especially celebrities, you can't use the basic questions there. What high school did you go to? <laughs> That's Rather, true. Rather, use that as a password. If you have three security challenge questions, why don't you use three different passwords or even random data that no one else would do? Then no one would ever be able to, to get the security challenge questions. That's what I typically do. And I understand that too, Scott. And we need to be better at protecting ourselves here because at, at the end of the day, it's us and it's also the companies. But I want to bring it back to you said passwords. What do you tell regular folks like me that have 15 different passwords with numbers and characters and asterisks and exclamation points and we, we can't remember all these complicated things? What do we, what do we realistically do here? <laughs> But we're all in the same boat. I have the same thing. I have a little black book that I write these passwords. I change them once a month. And it sounds crazy. Wow. Once a month, you need to change these. Never use the same password on your bank account as well as your login somewhere else or, or social media site. Different passwords for each. As you mentioned, 15 characters, symbols, put in the, the uh, backslash there, an asterisk, whatever. Maximum security right. on your password. 
gosh, we all, we all need to be a little bit better about that. I look at China a little bit differently. My opinion on this is they're going after a different target. In this case, with China, it's IP, intellectual property. They're st stealing billions of dollars of U.S. intellectual property from different corporations and really infiltrating and just taking this information and using it to advantage it. And again, it's probably government-sponsored, and a lot of the corporations and these cyber hack groups throughout China are in the U.S. for this intellectual property. Huge concern. It affects the economy globally and especially right here in the United States. And you had mentioned the economy being at stake here. Are we taking cybersecurity seriously enough? You mentioned we do have cyber command, but is the government realizing just how vulnerable we would be if we don't take this seriously? I think they're learning very quickly. You see how spending has increased. It's got the attention of every government agency across the board now. And they're actually establishing and working with uh, universities, setting up cybersecurity centers of excellence. In fact, we're working with a, a local university here to get these departments up and running, not just so they can address these uh, threats, but even to train the workforce so you have a cybersecurity workforce that, that can be used. There's a need for well over 50,000 jobs just in the cybersecurity arena to, to work for government agencies to help to, to, to prevent some of these uh, attacks and the threats. So there's a huge need and a lot of its education is needed, number one, and, and the government is, is kind of frantically trying to find how to get all these bodies there to fill these right. needs immediately. Next, one of my favorite topics, immigration. Also, looking forward to 2015, the GOP is going to need some help from the Latino community. What can we do? Well, I'll remind you. Keep it here. Immigration, immigration, immigration and immigration. I really can't say this enough. Of all the issues that should concern you, my fellow Americans, illegal immigration and amnesty should be at the very top of this list. Face it, most of us aren't directly impacted by what's going on in the Middle East or in West Africa. We care about things like missing Asian flights and the Ebola epidemic, but unless you're a nerd like me, a nuclear Iran probably doesn't keep you up at night. Well, I don't want to scare you, but President Obama's executive action, i.e. amnesty for 4 million illegals, is a concern. Last week, we talked about the benefits like the earned income tax credit that illegals will be granted. The devil is in the details. And don't worry, heading into 2015, I will keep nailing this issue to the wall. But first, let's take a look back. The Daily Caller's Mickey Koss joined me to talk turkey. As it turns out, a porous border brings more disaster than you'd expect. It brought us germs, too. Take a look. Obama sending these Central American kids fanning out across the country in August. And then all of a sudden, American kids started getting sick. Obviously, the, 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 the you know, instant un conclusion is maybe it was from these kids who are immune to this disease, but we aren't, so we, you know, a few of us get it, and if there are enough of us infected, and a lot of Americans are infected now, a few of them are going to die. Uh, it might be better in terms of public health if he actually kept those kids in that resort uh, with the sunset views rather than sending them to every school in America where, where accidentally they will infect people. So I'll give them the guitar lessons if they don't come to my neighborhood school. It sounds like we're importing more than diseases. We're also importing poverty, which is something that we're not talking about because it's not necessarily PC, but Mickey, you're not afraid to talk about it. Let's talk about how illegal immigration hurts social equality right here in the United States. Well, it dries down the wage of unskilled and uh, unskilled labor. So we have, you know, what's happened in the last 40 years? The answer is wages for people who just do basic labor, no college education, nothing fancy, haven't stagnated. They've gone down dramatically. So the idea that you could just work eight hours a day, four to five days a week, and make a decent living, that's gone out the window uh, unless you have some sort of fancy skill. Uh, unskilled immigrants just take that problem and double it by... Uh, providing cheap unskilled labor that Americans then have to compete with by lowering their own labor. So the, the Obama's big legislative priority is to make it harder for low-skilled Americans at the bottom of the labor market to make a living. Now, before you go thinking, I resent the Latino community, wait a sec. 
These people are not to blame. If I were in, these sho in their shoes, I'd want to get across the border and disappear into American society too. It's a mistake to place our resentment and blame on their shoulders. They have families, dreams, and aspirations like the rest of us. It would be great if we could accommodate everyone that wanted to live here. Well, the reality is we can't. That's why we have an immigration system and it needs fixing, I agree. How are we gonna do that? Well, with the help of Latino conservatives. Former chief of citizenship for the George W. Bush administration, Alfonso Aguilar, got us on point with this voting block and how the GOP can reach out. Take a listen. It's not enough to say, try to seal the border uh, if there's no mechanism to allow for the foreign workers that uh, our companies need to come here legally. Uh, we can put more assets along the southern border, but if we still have a demand for foreign workers, they're still going to come in and they're going to do it illegally. That's a problem that we have right now. I mean, we have de facto amnesty. We have a system that encourages people to come here illegally because we don't have a legal mechanism. You know, I'm sure you've heard a lot of people say, well, they have to stay in the back of the, uh, get in the back of the line. Well, for guest workers, there is no line. We don't have effective guest worker programs, or we have some that are capped uh, arbitrarily by Congress uh, with numbers that don't represent the needs of the labor market. So there's no effective legal way for foreign workers to come in the country. And Alfonso, I'm so glad you brought that up because that's what we haven't been focusing on enough is the jobs, the guest worker program. And I think Republicans want this as well because they see this as economically beneficial. But the problem right now is they're not even really talking about the guest worker program, at least on the Democrat Democrat side, they seem to be mostly just talking about extending DACA for the deferred uh, deferred action. So that really isn't going to solve the problem. Women and children are not the people that are applying for guest worker. Is that right. correct? Uh, that, that uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. DACA, deferred action, is, is not a solution. It doesn't provide legal status to the undocumented. It is a temporary solution. Exactly. It's just we temporary. Have to go to the we need root long, of the problem. long term goals here, and that's exactly. what I'm seeing. So, do you see anybody that's going to be able to champion this? Is Marco but, Rubio going to be the shining star? Well, I, I think certainly Marco Rubio can um, get involved in this debate again next year, especially if Republicans win the Senate. But I think you have other members that have uh, talked about this issue, that have talked about the importance of the Republican Party addressing constructively the immigration issue. One of them certainly is Senator Rand Paul, who's very supportive of a market-oriented guest worker program. Senator Mike Lee of Utah, and even Senator Ted Cruz. And in the House, don't forget Congressman Raul Labrador, who himself is an immigration attorney and is very supportive of a market-oriented guest worker program. Look, we have to make an economic, uh, populist, a populist economic argument that resonates with the middle class. Immigrants are not taking uh, jobs away from Americans. If anything, we need those foreign workers to expand uh, and grow companies so we can uh, create good paying jobs for working class Americans. Immigration helps create jobs for middle class Americans. And that's an argument that we haven't made. So I, I think earlier you made a very good point. We have ceded the Hispanic community and the issue of immigration to the Democrats. That's why Hispanics exactly. have been responding favorably to Democrats. But we have to reclaim this issue. We have to engage Hispanics with a positive message that it's not uh, what Obama is proposing. It's right. not amnesty, but it's a plan that is based on conservative principles. Because guess what? They can help our economy. And I think a lot of people, especially in middle America, are people that seem to be anti-immigration. If you attack this issue from an economic standpoint and we show people that immigrants can really help our economy if they're given a pathway that's legal and they're allowed to come in here and actually benefit us, I think that the, the dynamic of the debate will completely and entirely change. And that's the next thing I want to ask you about, Latino conservatism. So it seems to me like a lot of Latinos should be natural conservatives. Can you speak to this a little bit for me, Alfonso? Well, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, Ronald Reagan used to say Republicans are conservative. They just don't know it. And he didn't mean it in a condescending way. He meant that we have to engage them and educate them. You know, a lot of people say, well, many Hispanics love entitlements, love big government. And that may be the case, but that's not because they're naturally inclined towards big government. That's because they haven't heard from conservatives. They only have heard from liberals who only talk about entitlements. But if we engage them, I think they will understand the message. The our Hispanic community today is mostly, 40% is foreign born, and the rest, the majority, are children of immigrants. They came here 
fleeing uh, failed economies where there is big government looking for uh, forward to our system of, of liberties and opportunities uh, so they can start businesses. Last year, 20% of new businesses were created by, by Hispanics. So I think that if we engage them and we talk about our conservative values, they're going to respond very well. In terms of life, the majority support the right to life. In terms of marriage, the majority understand and believe that marriage is between a man and a woman. Well, On school social choice, issues. they're very supportive of school choice. Do you think that the oh, social absolutely. issues, though, do you think so, that's going to win the support and broaden our base if we focus on social issues as well as the economic issues? Because to me, it seems like we should be reaching out to these people and we should be sir, doing it effectively. Certainly. I mean, it has to be an integrated message. Even on economic issues, I think we have to talk about populist issues. Uh, for example, the, the, the rising prices. Uh, that's affecting uh, the Hispanic community. Uh, household income. The Hispanic community is the only group in the United States whose household income has actually gone down. Uh, so we can make that argument, but we're not making it. We have allow Democrats to control the, uh, the message towards the Hispanic community. Sadly, there are some conservatives who say, let's not even waste our time because they're natural born uh, Democrats. Well, mm. that's a fallacy. Our conservative message is a universal message. And if we appeal to them, they're going to respond very well. You said it. George Bush won 44 percent of the Hispanic vote in, in 2004. Mitt Romney won only 27 percent. If we show up in their communities, if exactly. we talk specifically we about ideas, we can win them over. And I certainly Absolutely. hope that uh, the Republicans are able to do this because our party isn't perfect either. We need to reach out and we need to preach our conservative values because ultimately at the end of the day, those values impact all of us and we should be able to get these people on board. Coming up, so apart from boots on the ground and nuclear weapons, we have some other fighting forces to play with. The less traditional side of our military might. Next, we take a look back at Blackwater and drones. Keep it here. Thanks for keeping it on point. Time to talk military might, but with a twist. We've covered military and special ops many times. Hey, I love me some military. But in addition to the traditional boots on the ground and support our troops talk, we also hit on some less traditional methods of force. Not all soldiers are created equal. In fact, some of those men fighting our battles aren't soldiers at all. They're paid to kill. Yet private defense contractors. You've probably heard of Blackwater, the most infamous private security firm. Well, after seven years of investigation, four Blackwater guards were convicted of murder and criminal manslaughter after an incident in Israel Square, Baghdad. Now, does this prove that military might cannot be outsourced? I invited senior fellow at the Center for International Policy, Matthew Ho, to the On Point bullpen to shed some light on the dark side of Blackwater. Here it is. The way they differ is that they are a private company. They fall under a contract, just as if you have a service contract to uh, cook food or deliver fuel or clean laundry. It is a contract that's bound by the same rules and regulation that binds other kinds of federal contracts. So there is actually a project manager and a contracting officer that oversee the security guards. Additionally, you have uh, State Department's diplomatic security, if they're attached to the State Department team, who also look over them. But the problem is, is that you maybe only have a handful or a half dozen diplomatic security officers to police hundreds, if not, and actually thousands of security guards. Now, this case obviously changes the game. Um, in 2007, Congress subjected them to the Uniform Code of Justice, so they actually have to report to someone. But now this case kind of stirs things up a little bit. Is this going to set a precedent? Are we going to have more oversight in the future? I, I hope it does. I hope it does. There's been um, movement. Senator Pat Leahy uh, of Vermont has been pushing for years now to uh, increase the oversight on security contractors overseas, um, but that's gone nowhere. Um, so this is, for those of us who are saying, look, this is very dangerous. Warfare is inherently a government responsibility. It's inherently a military responsibility. When you outsource it to private companies, their primary responsibility now is to either their shareholders or to their board, not to the policy of the United States. Additionally, too, what you have is you have um, 
not a military chain of command. You have a corporate chain of command that, again, is not responsible directly to the military, but is responsible to a contracting officer and a project manager, manager completely different than saying, you know, having Marines or soldiers responsible to a company commander or a battalion commander or a division commander. And Matt, so, you mentioned earlier that you actually have worked with these contractors yeah. in the past. So in your opinion, do they deserve their bad reputation or was it just a few bad apples that are ruining it for all of them? I, I think the problem, Tommy, is that what you have is you had certainly the guys I worked with, 98% of them were great guys, terrific guys, noble intentions, good intentions. But the problem is when you're in these wars, when you're in the middle of a civil war where nothing makes sense, in particular, say those wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq, a lot of awful, absurd things are going to happen. And when it's not being controlled by the military, you have the case now of uh, war activities, uh, war making activities being conducted by private companies. You now have that profit motive in there, which makes a difficult situation being in the middle of a civil war, even more difficult. Private military contractors aren't the only tool in our defense arsenal. Nope, hand-to-hand -hand or even bullet-to-body warfare has a cousin, the drone. President Obama likes to use them to take out terrorists, but our videographers here at One America like to use the much smaller version to get shots of a different kind. This is all very rele relevant now because commercial drone operations are likely to be regulated in 2015 in the U.S., which possesses the world's biggest military drone fleet. The FAA has been promising to make drone rules public early this year. You know, I'll get you on point with that, but in the meantime, let's look back at our very own on point drone segment. Roll it. Than a little wind, it seems pretty harmless. Yeah, they're not too bad. But I do have to ask you now that you're sitting down joining with me because these seem all fun and games, but there, there are concerns, there are legitimate concerns. What happens when someone uses these for wrong and they use them for a bad purpose? So then are we going to start seeing the government really clamp down on civilian drone use? Uh, I think so. It's already started to go that direction anyway, just because people are scared of what could happen using these. Do we have a right to be scared though? I mean, who's to stop somebody from strapping an explosive on something like this and bring it into your neighborhood? It's a good question, but there's people been doing using vehicles for things like that for years. I mean, they, you did the same thing with uh, with cars in Iraq. You know, strap it to the uh, a car and drive it right through the front of the base. It's the same concept. I mean, it's I something it, to always be scared about. It just seems like someone with a remote control. I think that makes people a little nervous. I know myself seeing it and being able to tangibly have it in front of me. It doesn't look so scary. But obviously, with these becoming more and more advanced, do you think as they get better technology that people have more reason? for concern? I think with the technology advancing on this end, it's going to advance on the, the counter side of it as well. I mean, there's, there's radar jammers that have been around for years. It's the same concept with this. There's ways to knock these out of the sky using lasers. You know, so um, it's, it all runs on RF signal. So if you don't have an RF signal, it drops. But I is mean, that going to change, though, when the technology gets better? Are more people going to be able to operate these? Are they going to have better capabilities, and then people are going to get a little bit more concerned? Uh, there are certain frequency bands that you can operate on, and you're, we only have access to certain frequencies uh, in the civilian marketplace. The government operates on higher powered and, and different frequency bands than us. So we're never going to have access to those. It's always going to be military. And even so, you can overpower and walk all over the signal of these anyway. So you're not okay. going to really be able to fly them if you don't want to fly them in a certain area. As okay. soon as that technology advances. I have to ask you, because you make it look easy to fly one of these. But for someone that's not familiar with them as you are, are these pretty easy to fly? Could anyone learn how to use these? They, in theory. Um, in theory, it's not it's, like a remote control plane? Simple. Uh, no, it's easy on a remote control plane. Um, the biggest thing with this is orientation. They've okay. got a bunch of sensors in there. You've got accelerometer, barometer, GPS. Um, all these things make it pretty relatively simple to fly. I can release the sticks and it'll hold its position when you're outside as long as you have a clear sky and a good GPS signal. Um, what messes people up, I mean, we've got veterans that have been flying for 20 years, airplanes and, and helicopters, stunt pilots that come in and crash these all the time because the orientation can kind of throw you off. Well, it's, it's, not a learning, it's got a learning curve to it. You have to learn exactly. how to do it. I want to ask you too, we talked a little bit about the terror aspect, but how are these going to change the economy? 
What can these do for us that people probably don't understand? Well, um, that's the biggest thing about the FAA right now is they want to get their cut because a lot of people are starting to use these, creating small businesses, um, using them for existing businesses to get aspects and shots that you could never get back. What about like agriculture? I know we were discussing that earlier, talking yeah. about drones just here in the office. Everyone's really interested. Everyone wants to weigh in. So we're talking about for agricultural purposes, right. if ranchers and farmers want to fly over their fields, look at their crops, look at their livestock, something like this going to save people money and help our economy? What do you think? Absolutely. Um, this coupled with multispectral imaging is, is huge. And there's a lot of Kickstarter campaigns out there for it right now. Um, uh, stitching images together, you can actually uh, check for uh, droughts in areas, um, high uh, insect uh, populations and things like that. So it's definitely going to be an asset to the agriculture market. And, and the last few years, a lot of companies have been ramping up, creating models for just that because it can save uh, farmers and, you know. Well, it seems farmers. really practical to me. So as I understand it, there's not a law against commercial drone use, but rather a policy. Can you speak to this a little bit? Uh, it's based on the AMA regulations that have been around for years, uh, not over right. 400 feet, not within five miles of an airport, and not for commercial purposes. Which So then you mentioned for commercial purposes. So if I want to go fly one of these for fun, I can do it. But if I use it for a commercial purpose, then I get a slap on the wrist, or what happens to me? Correct. So the FAA started issuing $10,000 cease and desist letters to certain companies. Okay. Uh, they've been countersued by them and lost numerous times. Um, they're not a regulatory body, so they can't really do that, um, which is why they've lost those cases. Uh, I, I think that there needs to be some regulation just based on some of the customers that have come into my store and okay. know what they do. Um, I, I think it definitely needs to be regulated, but I think the biggest holdup is the FAA trying to figure out how we can make money off of this and do it safely. Right. And they don't have very much time to figure it out because these are becoming more and more common. So I guess we're right. just going to have to wait and see. But I'm glad you mentioned that, that there does need to be some regulation. We just need to have common sense answers to it, I think. And I hope going right. forward that maybe the government will be able to, to do that in, in this instance. Yeah. Still ahead, it's called the American Dream, but I want to change that. How about the American Grind? Dreams are great, but action is better. My final thoughts are next, so keep it on point with me. Thanks for keeping it on point with me for some final thoughts tonight. So here we are. It's a new year. Last week I talked about the seven promises we should keep this year. Well, I have one more. Adjust your attitude. It really will change your entire perspective. If you walk into work with a smile and a positive outlook, I promise you, you will get through the day. Actually, more than that. It will allow you to kick today's butt, not just get through it. We all have a job to do. Do it and do it with pride. Bet you didn't know the creator of Flamin' Hot Cheetos was actually the janitor at a Frito-Lay plant right here in the Golden State. Yeah, he spoke little to no English, but he had an idea and the will to do something about it. He pitched it to the company president, and now we not only have a whole line of Flamin' Hot snacks, we also have another example of the American dream. Richard Montana's now leads multicultural sales and community promotions across PepsiCo's North American divisions. Instead of feeling sorry for himself, he picked himself up by his bootstraps and conquered. Here's the deal. If you're having a good day, it'll probably get worse. But on the flip side, if you're having a bad day, it'll get better. Nothing in life is constant. That's a good thing. Think about it. If every day was perfect, life would be so boring. The struggle is part of the story. Did you make a mistake or do something really embarrassing? Shake it off. You'll laugh about it someday. We always do. Let's talk about equal opportunity for a second. Life isn't fair. But we all have the same 24 hours a day, seven days a week to work towards something. It's your butt, you move it. Nobody is impressed with how good your excuses are. It's not about having time or luck, it's about making time and luck. If it matters to you, you'll make time for it and you'll make it happen. Save the excuses, refuse to live behind them. If your past was tough, make your future better. Don't repeat the same mistakes, whether they're yours or someone else's. It's a waste of time. Call yourself out on your own BS and you'll move mountains. Lastly, surround yourself with good vibes. We all have energy. What's yours? With that, thanks for getting on point with me tonight for this flashback show. It's been fun and the best is yet to come. I plan to make 2015 the year of on point. What topics do you want to cover? Reach out on Twitter, Twitter and Instagram at Tommy Laren or email me directly at tommy.laren at onn.com. You know I always get back to you personally. Have a great night and take care.
Bye-bye.